All right, folks, we have as close to what amounts to a breaking news story here as we ever really get. If you'll remember that a few months ago, the news broke that the Cardinal Archpriest of St. Peter's Basilica, Mauro Gambetti, in the Vatican limited the saying of the traditional Latin Mass and all Masses not on the regular schedule in pretty draconian ways. This focused on St. Peter's Basilica specifically. That news sent shockwaves around the church with people of all liturgical preferences wondering what had happened. St. Peter's began to be described online as kind of a ghost town, where at one time there was always a mass being said, or nearly always, now not so much. Then came the news that Samorum Pontificum was on the chopping block, and we began to get a pretty dark picture getting painted for us. Now we have some new news. The restrictions on the TLM at St. Peter's Basilica have been modified, or so it appears, as well as the reasoning behind the limitation of private masses in general being made more clear. So let's dive into this. First, I want to give credit to Rorate Cherley and Diana Montagna for this. Rorate Cherley tweeted this out, which is how I found out about it, so thanks to them for sharing the story, and Diane Montagna is the one who translated the document that I'm about to have for you. Rorate Cherley posted it on their site, and I'll have some of it here for you. Here's a bit of their update. Quote, Today, Cardinal Mauro Gambetti, the new Cardinal Archpriest in charge of St. Peter's Basilica, who all sources informed us was caught completely unaware by the decree, published a clarification note trying to somewhat fix the situation. This time the note, here in Italian, was signed and published in the Bolotino of the Holy See. It is a long note, but the main points are the following. While the prohibitions are somewhat held, they are limited to the 7 to 9 a.m. period, in which there are more masses. Even during this time of the day, care should be taken to welcome all kinds of groups of pilgrims, in view of the basilica being the essential focus of unity in the church. Private masses can also be allowed in specific cases, when a concelebration is not going on at the same time after being the object of discernment. End quote. Now, instead of my explaining what the document says, at least up front, I'm going to let Cardinal Gambetti speak for himself. Here's the full statement from him. Note from St. Peter's Basilica on the Order of Eucharistic Celebrations. This again came out yesterday. Having received from the Holy Father the mandate to take care of and animate the liturgical life of St. Peter's Basilica, I would like to propose some considerations based on the statement of the Secretariat of State of 12th March 2021, which I hope will be useful in understanding the guidelines outlined and in choosing how and when to celebrate the Eucharist in the early morning hours. The statement of the Secretariat of State has given several dispositions regarding the celebration of Holy Masses in St. Peter's Basilica, with the intention of ensuring that they take place in an atmosphere of recollection and liturgical decorum. The indications refer to a precise context, namely the organization of liturgical actions in the time slot between 7 and 9 a.m. They are essentially inspired by two principles. A. To order the celebrations from the point of view of their time frame and quality. B. To welcome and integrate particular and legitimate wishes of the faithful as far as possible. In fact, the content of the proposals set out by the Secretariat of State can be summarized as follows. A. Between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., priests may con-celebrate at one of the hourly masses in the designated places. Liturgical animation shall include the assistance of altar servers. B. Exceptions are allowed with regard to the places of celebration, on the occasion of the memorial of a saint whose remains are housed in the basilica, and the simultaneous holding of certain celebrations for groups of pilgrims or in the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite. For ease of reading, I shall articulate these notes, notes according to the two above-mentioned points. A. Con celebrations from 7 to 9 a.m. The manner of ordering the morning celebrations envisaged in the statement of the Secretary of State provides an opportunity to recall the meaning and value of Eucharistic con celebration, which, as the Fathers of the Last Council recalled, is part of the Church's tradition. Quote, Con celebration, whereby the unity of the priesthood is appropriately manifested, has remained in use to this day in the church both in the East and the West. End quote. See Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph 57. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council, in its Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, extended the faculty for priests to concelebrate, and subsequent magisterial documents have specified the norms. In this sense, it may be useful to recall some cases in which the magisterium recommends concelebration, such as at the main mass at the ch in a church or at a masses on the occasion of meetings of priests, secular or religious, whatever their character. 
See Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph 57, and the General Instruction of the Roman Missal, page 199. On the other hand, the very nature of the celebration is clearly defined in Sacrosanctum Concilium, where it deals with the norms drawn from the hierarchy and communal nature of the liturgy. Quote, Liturgical services are not private functions, but are celebrations of the Church, which is the sacrament of unity, namely the holy people united and ordered under their bishops. Therefore, liturgical services pertain to the whole body of the Church. They manifest it and have effects upon it. Whenever rites, according to their specific nature, make provision for communal celebration involving the presence and active participation of the faithful, this way of celebrating them is to be preferred, so far as possible, to a celebration that is individual and quasi-private. This applies with a special force to the celebration of Mass and the administration of the sacraments, even though every Mass has of itself a public and social nature, and lengthy quote, see Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraphs 26 to 27. Therefore, the assembly gathered for the Eucharist fully manifests the mystery of the Church, the living body of Christ. This is recalled by Lumen Gentium, where it treats of the common priesthood exercised in the sacraments, and it is also clearly recalled by the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which affirms that it is the whole community, the body of Christ, united to its head, that celebrates. In this perspective, one understands how the greatest fruit of the Eucharist is drawn from participation in the same action, because it better expresses the mystery that is celebrated. Clearly, all those who make up the assembly gathered for the Eucharist participate in the one sacrificed and priesthood of Christ, each according to his own state and condition of life. Bishop, priest, deacon, baptized, those in the nuptial sacrament, and religious. In a Mass concelebrated by several priests, there is no diminution of value and fruits of the Eucharistic sacrifice, but rather a full exaltation of them. A first element for discernment in our context is therefore this. Whenever possible, it is more than fitting for priests to concelebrate, given also the fact that there is a regular alternation of presiding over the concelebrations that ordinarily takes place in St. Peter's Basilica. The same is also true for individual members of the faithful and groups who are invited to take part in the same Mass, so that it may be an expression of fraternity and not of particularism, which does not reflect the sense of the Church. Part B. Exceptions The Magisterium teaches that exceptions may be made to situations in which concelebration is recommended, when the benefit of the faithful does not require or advise otherwise. In this sense, the importance of understanding language in the liturgy in relation to charity and the pastoral value which the celebration of the Eucharist can have should not be underestimated for a group of pilgrims in according with the existing rites of the Catholic Church. In addition to these considerations, there are a number of elements of the reality which characterizes the basilica must be taken into due account. The size of St. Peter's Basilica and its architecture makes it possible to meet the different needs of those who wish to celebrate the Eucharist in groups without overlapping, with the concelebration taking place in the main liturgical sites. St. Peter's Basilica is characterized by the Petrine ministry of unity, mercy, and orthodoxy of faith, and welcomes pilgrims from all over the world. In the time slot between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., attendance at St. Peter's Basilica is limited in number. For celebrations with the 1962 Missale Romanum, everything possible must be done to fulfill the wishes of the faithful and priests as stipulated in Modu Proprio Samorum Pontificum. Furthermore, without detracting in any way from the legitimacy of the celebration of Mass by individual priests, also when the faithful cannot participate, it is necessary to recognize the decisive character of the rule that prohibits celebrating individually while a con celebration is taking place in the same church or oratory. See the 1983 Code of Canon Law, Canon 902. For this reason, I have already given instructions to ensure the request to celebrate during the 7 to 9 a.m. period by groups with special and legitimate needs will be granted as far as possible. Requests for individual celebrations can also be discerned on a case-by-case -case basis, without prejudice to the principle that everything should take place in an atmosphere of recollection and decorum, and taking, place, taking care to ensure what is exceptional does not become ordinary, distorting the intentions and the meaning of the magisterium. Thus I am confident that the path we have embarked upon will enable every priest and every member of the faithful to experience celebrations in St. Peter's in a way that is ever more ordered to goodness, beauty, and truth. Issued in Vatican City on the 22nd of June, 2021, by Mauro Cardinal Gambetti, the Archpriest of the Basilica of St. Peter. 
and this is a working translation by Diane Montagna. So if you're still here, the explanation is essentially that the Vatican is trying to promote con-celebration of the Mass, which is the practice of more than one priest saying the Mass together, the same Mass, simultaneously. It is, as far as I know, a new conciliar practice. There's no real analog in the traditional liturgy, where instead you would have priests doing the part of the various deacons and subdeacons, depending on the form of the traditional liturgy. But that Mass was not con-celebrated, strictly speaking. The Cardinal wanted to make it clear that the needs of pilgrims and others will be seen on a case-by-case -case basis for having Masses said on the side altars and on the main altars within the guidelines of liturgical decorum, which probably means they don't want multiple Masses being said simultaneously to the point that they disrupt one another. Not that I've heard that complaint level before. If you've gone to the Mass in those conditions and say, Peters, let me know in the comments, please. I'm genuinely curious. And one thing that is striking about this is that this was apparent, the original decree was apparently disseminated without his knowledge. That should be food for thought for people. Anyway, as for my thoughts on this, it's rather simple. I'm a bit mystified because I've seen people say on social media that this proves that there was no nefarious intent with the limiting of private masses. I'm not seeing that at all. If what we have seen to this date has been the product of miscommunication, then I can expect to see an end of the ghost town vibe in St. Peter's that numerous priests have described on social media. We can expect at least one mass being said nearly at all times in the near future, right? If you want to read this for yourself, I have a link in my show notes today at returntotradition.org for the full translated text. Skip past the Patreon pop-up because, as I always say, there's no paywall for my sources. Unless, you know, if you want to become a patron, that's always, of course, welcome. Anyway, those are my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know in the comments, please, and like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.